Welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Mark Kennedy, director of the WABA Institute for Strategic Competition. You know, when you evaluate the People Republics of China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, most people evaluate the symptoms of its implementations, the environmental degradation, the fact that they're using Chinese labor as opposed to developing the local workforce, the fact that it's piling a lot of debt on with high interest rates on developing countries and projects that aren't always, you know, the best projects, and the promotion of or continuation of corruption, as well as the fact that when there's a default, it seems that China ends up with strategic strategic assets like ports or undersea cables. Now those are all true, uh, but we have a new re book out from Yale University Press that instead of focuses focusing on the symptoms is focusing on the strategy. The book is titled The Belt and Road City, Geopolitics, Urbanizations, and China's Search for New International Order. We're pleased to have the co-authors of that book with us here today. Simon Curtis, Associate Professor in International Affairs with Surrey Uni University of Surrey, and he's also a senior fellow at the Chicago Council for Global Affairs. We also have Ian Kloffs, uh, founding director of Carnegie, California, and formerly a senior advisor to the State Department for Global Cities. Joining me also, I have Leah Thome, uh, who is a Schwartzman Fellow here at the Wilson Center, who will be co-moderating with me. So we've got a great discussion coming on some important questions that this book addresses. Let me start out with you, Simon, and asking, uh, in the book, you paint that just as the U.S., when it uh, promulgated the Marshall Plan, it had intents to do good for Europe, yes, but also to shape international order, to make sure that the more moderate elements of Europe came out and that it didn't drift into the Soviet circle. You suggest that similarly, China, amongst its goals for the BRI, is to shape international order in a way that is more accepting of its way of government and its values. Uh, please explain how you see BRI really having an effect on global order. Okay, well, Mark, thank you very much um, for the question and for inviting us here. Um, we argue in the book uh, that the Belt and Road Initiative is, in fact, the centerpiece of a long-term grand strategy to build an international order that's more reflective of China's interests, China's preferences, China's norms and values. And what it does is it carefully ties itself to a, a historical narrative of the ancient and medieval Silk Roads. And this is a, a period, not, not coincidentally, in which China was central to the international system and uh, one that preceded uh, the rise of the West. And the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, truly kind of vast in its scope and ambition. It's unprecedented in many ways currently taking in around 150 countries uh, now across Africa, Eurasia and beyond. And when we talk about a long term uh, strategy, we really mean long term, one that will pay off over decades if if the strategy goes to plan for China. So uh, the original completion date for the Belt and Road is envisaged as 2049. This is the uh, centenary, of course, of the Chinese Communist Party taking power at the end of the Chinese Civil War. And, and so the Belt and Road is an umbrella term in many respects for all the different policies and steps that China is taking to build, and, and I mean literally often to, to build out the components that would help to bring that new international order into being, gradually joining up over the decades to generate new pathways to a new world, one that might look quite different to the world that we have today. Um, which is, of course, as we know, been characterized by liberal values and institutions and underwritten by U.S. geopolitical power. And in the book, we, we break these different dimensions of the grand strategy down. So uh, we talk about infrastructural components uh, at the very kind of smallest scale. So roads and railways, ports, uh, digital infrastructures. Um, and then we move up the scale to cities and urban life and then transnational urban corridors, international institutions, all the way up to the larger scale of international order itself. So what you have in the book is this kind of upward journey of scale going on 
And one of our main and, and um, kind of original arguments, I would say, is that if you want to talk about the transformation of international order, you have to think about its material elements too. How such orders are, are built literally out of material components, of infrastructure, of urbanism. And it is by, by building out these material components that they become enduring across the decades, if not longer, in terms of international order. So this is a, an aspect of international order that is often missed and infrastructure is at its very core. And China's Belt and Road strategy recognizes this. And we could take this further and we could say that if the West wishes to respond to the reach of the Belt and Road Initiative, and remember this is uh, something that has a decade uh, head start, it would do well to recognize the relationship between infrastructure, cities, international order. Uh, a lesson, uh, as you suggested, that it had learned once with the Marshall Plan in the early Cold War, for example. And just to finish on this one, one last uh, caveat I would make here is that in the book, we're not suggesting that the BRI will necessarily succeed in delivering China's broader strategic goals, especially in its ambitions to transform international order. It may uh, well not do so uh, for many, many reasons, all sorts of reasons. But what we do want to argue is that for any international order to successfully be built and to successfully endure, it has to manifest itself in space by generating new forms of material infrastructures, new forms of urban life. And it's this link that I think has often been forgotten when we think about international affairs between international order and cities and their connective infrastructures that we hope to recapture in the book, and that's a large theme of what, what we write about. Excellent. Thea? Ian, in your book, you seek to contrast two different types of cities, global cities like New York and London, set up during an era of US dominance, and BRI cities influenced by China, seeking to shape cities in its own image. How do BRI cities differ from those we have grown used to and that many of us have grown up in? What are similarities? But what kind of unique characteristics have emerged through the disposition of BRI infrastructure abroad? <clears throat> Thanks, Leah. Um, and let me thank you and Mark and, and the Waba Institute for Strategic Competition uh, for having Simon and I for this conversation. I, I speak for, for Simon, I know, and I'm saying that we've long uh, admired the way you all have brought the, WISC has brought uh, infrastructure into strategic conversations, uh, something that we obviously think in our own work um, is an imperative. Um, and if you say the word disposition, Simon Curtis is likely to jump through the screen uh, with excitement. Um, so thanks for offering that at the outset too, because it opens up all sorts of corridors uh, for further conversation. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to, to perhaps take a step back and and I think it'll probably be clear in this conversation that Simon is more of someone who thinks about international order as an IR scholar. Uh, I'm a historian. Um, I think about cities uh, and cities as instruments of power, but also actors on the global stage. And it's worth um, taking a step back to think about the ways in which cities have been actors, but also been instrumentalized by great powers uh, and empires previously. There's nothing new to the idea. In fact, it's uh, developed well historically that cities are... Um, containers, so to speak, opportunities for great powers to amplify or project their power. Um, we've seen this uh, dating back to the Roman Empire, of course, and even before. Uh, and if you look in the 19th century, the European empires, they left a legacy of uh, urban shaping that lasts even through to today and to the post-colonial moment, say, after World War II, uh, in the decades after World War II, Efforts by newly independent states to use city spaces, you know, the built environment, material, uh, to speak to both values, independence, um, and, and a certain confidence. And so the idea that cities are tied to state-making projects or great power foreign policy projects um, is a well-developed one. The global city, uh, which you rightly point out, Leia, is something that we hold out somewhat in contrast to and overlapping with uh, this potential BRI city, is kind of unique uh, in a way. And, and of course, there's a you all have a large foreign policy crowd in Washington, um, and it is an advent of, a, a byproduct of um, American hegemony in, in, in parts of the post-World War II order. The thing that's unique about the global city, and the idea has been around for about 20 years, and it's been contested heavily uh, in urbanist circles, um, that dates back to Saskia Sassen, um, is that, that it emerged from um, certain 
parts of the international order that Simon can speak to that include the free movement of capital and the free movement of talent. And so really post Bretton Woods in some ways. Um, and that American hegemony helped foster it. And, and we discussed London and New York as examples, but there are examples all over the world as well. You could easily look at Tokyo, um, uh, uh, Singapore to some degree, uh, obviously Sydney um, as global cities as well. Um, and the interesting thing about the global city in contrast to the BRI city that is emerging um, is that th there was a little bit of a, um, uh, how we, we, if you think back to the British Empire, the, um, an, uh, an absent-mindedness uh, in terms of urban form uh, that led to its result. Treasury officials and trade negotiators played a huge role in setting the structure that allowed the global city to emerge. They weren't urbanists, they weren't designers, they weren't thinking about urban effects, nor was that their job. The interesting thing about the BRI city um, and within the context of the BRI is that it's a it's a it's a global strategy um, that has a known and understood and intentional urban dimensions, um, and so this dates back to the to the intentionality that China has around its own urban planning in the last four decades, but also thinking about what it's doing to urban spaces around the world at the same time. So some of the aspects of the global city that are sort of coming into um, emergence right now that differ from say the um, the global city as we've known it include a, a focus on logistics and trade tied to emerging urban corridors as opposed to just global connections, um, a focus on gateways and gateway cities and gateway infrastructure that link these corridors, and a sense of the city's connectivity to infrastructure, logistics, and movement rather than just the movement of capital and people, um, but also things with a Belt and Road city, always existing sort of spatially as part of new regional concepts. Um, I think later in the conversation, perhaps we can get into some of the specificity about how these cities come into being, um, the bilateral exchanges, the agreements, uh, especially when we talk about ports, the use of architects and designers, um, but it's this connectivity via corridors and infrastructure that are really unique uh, as it compares to the global city. Interesting uh, analysis there. And, and Simon, turning back to you, uh, you know, we've had a lot of analysis when we look at the economic impact of uh, the BRI benefits to China, uh, a focus on the fact that it's uh, helping them absorb excess capacity in their construction industry, that it's also giving them access to minerals as well as resources. But you bring up a number of other economic benefits uh, to uh, China from the BRI, one of which is escaping the middle income trap. And when you, when you think about what does this do to help them readjust value chains and have the economic landscape be more favorable uh, to China, explain that theory a bit more. Okay, um, thank you, Mark. So Many scholars have noticed that China's in a classic middle income trap in that it's no longer very cheap in terms of wage levels for labor, um, for the intensive commodity production, but its workers are not yet able to compete in the higher value added sectors because productivity is too low. And so the, the Belt and Road Initiative, some people would argue, is, is in part a tool to cut a new path into the world economic system for Chinese economic actors. So one way that we can see this is in the uh, Made in China 2025 strategic plan, uh, which was announced quite some time ago, along with the, the Belt and Road Initiative. And this um, Made in China 2025 plan envisages China moving away from its traditional position as the workshop of the world, the low cost manufacturing hub that we uh, have seen it to be, to become a high tech, high value economy leading the way in a lot of different industry sectors such as biotech or pharmaceuticals uh, now ai robotics automated vehicles battery production um, shipping aerospace those kind of industries and all uh, in terms of the plan with a, this new emphasis on green and sustainable technology in line with an emerging notion china has of building a distinctive ecological civilization with chinese characteristics which is also tied up in the uh, the Belt and Road. We'll um, come back to that, I think, maybe later on. Um, so commentators have, have, have remarked at how, in order to move up that global value chain, to move out of these lower skilled, low wage manufacturing niche that, um, that the country currently occupies, 
these jobs would have to then be relocated elsewhere. And this is one of the ways in which the Belt and Road Initiative comes in. So, for example, one of the big key corridors of the Belt and Road Initiative, and there are six major economic uh, and urban corridors that are attached to the BRI, is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And this is uh, perhaps the most developed of the six corridors where China is trying to provide development assistance to Pakistan so that as an economic partner, it might itself move into the low cost manufacturing market that China is vocating. So countries like um, Pakistan and other countries across Southeast Asia might provide the components and inputs needed for these higher value added activities that would then be undertaken by Chinese firms. And the Belt and Road is one of the ways in which uh, that can be put into motion, if you like. Great. You've write that increasingly connected cities have started to rely on smart technology and are becoming smart cities even. One domestic example that you cited for China is the city of Kashgar, which you identify as a negative example of increasing technologization and urbanization due to surveillance being embedded in the urban fabric. Many of the countries that China seeks to close our ties to are of an authoritarian nature. Simon, I'm curious, how does this technology help them in controlling their citizens and how can the West counter this trend? Okay, thank you, Leah, uh, for that question. So, I mean, smart cities, uh, when we talk about smart cities, we're talking about cities whose fabrics have begun to incorporate digital technologies of various sorts are developing around the world, as we know, there's not obviously just a Chinese phenomenon, of course, we, we, we have them uh, in, in the US and the UK as well. Um, and although such systems offer the, the kind of promise of increased urban efficiency, better urban, urban governance due to providing new flows of data, there have often been concerns around surveillance and privacy that come along with those, uh, with those technologies. And one of the arguments that we make in the book, um, and, and this draws on some ideas in the sociology of technology as a, as, a, as a kind of academic discipline, is that when we think about infrastructure and technologies, we never think of them simply as neutral tools. They, they always bear the stamp of the context and the values of the society that produced them. So one of the examples you might sort of used to illustrate this is the original internet, which developed in the context of, of, of the US and its culture of indivi individual liberty, uh, decentralization, free markets. And the argument is that that culture helps to shape the form that the internet took. It helps to shape the way that technology takes root. And in China, we know that the social values are very different, right? So social order, social control, are very much part of those values, as is top down hierarchical authority. So it's a very different social context. And the digital technologies emerging in that context, we would argue, are going to then take on a very different form, as would the fabric of the cities that they thread themselves through. And, and so the Belt and Road Initiative, again, as with the previous example, is a way to export some of those models models emerging in the Chinese context to other places around the world. This is an example of what we mean when we say that international order is developed slowly across time via the construction of material components. Once in place, they're hard to dislodge and they shape the choices of individuals in the future. So the example you gave uh, of Kashgar is an important, if, if extreme, example. It was once uh, a trading outpost of the ancient Silk Road. And again, Kashgar today is situated at a critical kind of strategic nodal point along the Belt and Road Initiative as a gateway to the regional neighbors of Central Asia that the BRI hopes to cultivate um, or China hopes to cultivate through the BRI. But it is also a city, as we know, that's seen political unrest recently. Um, it's a predominantly Muslim Uyghur population. We know of the uh, terrorist attacks of 2008, 2011, the heavy government crackdown that has um, taken place since then. And so Kashgar, as a result of that crackdown, has become a surveillance city with cameras and facial recognition scans and checkpoints and ID cards and digital control centers becoming part of the fabric of ev everyday life. But what we would, one of the points we make in the book is that 
uh, many of these technological forms um, are the same technologies that are being used now in many other cities around the world that are being exported from China to other cities. So Chinese firms have exported smart cities or safe city style technologies and services to more than 100 countries, including uh, the United States to some degree. So examples would be the Pakistani cities of Lahore that we talk about in the book or the Kenyan cities of Nairobi or Mombasa. Um, they have all bought systems from China that incorporate thousands of cameras into their urban fabric and other technological components of the type that I talked about. So the technologies trialed in China in the Chinese context then spread out along the conduits of the Belt and Road uh, into the cities that it is helping to shape. And that I think is something that we need to be conscious of um, as having a long term impact. Great, thank you. Turning back to you, Ian, you described that infrastructure, once in place, extends agency into the future and are hard to reshape that they lay down path dependencies that will shape the development of international systems for decades, if not centuries to come. You mentioned one example of bridge heights in Long Island. We have also just discussed how digital infrastructure has long-term consequences. What other type of infrastructure should we be concerned about relative to unfavorable path dependencies? <clears throat> Thanks, Leanne. Um, uh, it, I always appreciate little tidbits that illustrate that people have actually read the book because um, it, it's not a it's not a whole chapter that's focused on the bridge height, but really just the passing reference. And it's actually to Robert Moses, um, which means uh, to his work, of course, uh, that's pretty familiar to many and gives me the opportunity to mention that that I should also say that Jane Jacobs once worked for the State Department. So the idea of thinking at the urban scale from a foreign policy perspective, although she did very briefly, um, isn't entirely new. Uh, and yes, Simon and I are um, in part because of the BRI, but also just in more general, if you're in interested in infrastructure or if you're interested in, say, climate change or, or um, democratic practices, interested in some of the intergenerational aspects of, of strategy and, and the temporal time horizons that are captured. They're in, and, and we're all familiar with infrastructure that we use daily around us um, that was developed decades, uh, in some cases, centuries uh, before we were present. And the fact that uh, the politics that shaped it, the cultures that shaped it, to which Simon spoke earlier, um, are now um, part of the fabric that shapes our, our daily life. Um, and so I think uh, as we enter into conversations about decoupling, as we enter into conversations about the success or failure, uh, uh, though those concepts are kind of complicated, of the BRI itself, around which many are focused right now, um, the infrastructure that's been developed already uh, exists, and it most likely will continue to exist. Uh, it, it has dispositions, it favors, um, it, it excludes, it has prejudices built into it. Uh, and one of the things that we argue in the book is that a huge amount of that infrastructure has implications in urban spaces. Um, again, the Robert Moses, Jane Jacobs reference, and that those urban spaces are where the vast majority of the world lives. Those urban spaces, especially in Africa and Asia, are the fastest growing urban spaces in the world, uh, which means how they develop, how people move in them, how they make a living, uh, how they get medical treatment will have uh, impacts on well-being and carbon emissions. Uh, and so for cities, you can look at some issues. Um, obviously, some of the easy ones like train travel um, in East Africa between cities and between countries. A place like Djibouti, you can look at the, the development of new uh, port spaces and, and the cities that are associated with it. Um, Gwadar City in Pakistan, you actually have huge issues around housing and economic development that are tied to the attempt to develop a deep sea port there. And so one of the things that's in interesting in terms of when you pay attention to these large scale infrastructure projects is the infrastructure itself, some of which we'll discuss, uh, I suspect, later when we get the port, some of which Simon has laid out as it comes to uh, data and, and smart cities. But also there are massive ecosystems that develop around them that include transportation, education, water, health. Uh, and we try to argue that those spaces are being shaped by these products too. So it's not enough to just look at the infrastructure, but we also have to look at the, the built environment of the cities around them to understand the full impacts and projection of power that's taking place. Uh, very interesting. And uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about how that will shape the future. Uh, let's maybe go back to the economic side, if we could, uh, Simon. We talked about how it's helping them in the middle income trap, but also it's having an effect 
on decoupling. You know, we've talked about are we decoupling or de-risking, but in reality, BRI, you argue, helps uh, China achieve its dual circulation strategy of, of being less dependent on the West at the same time it keeps the West dependent on them. Uh, two of the ways you highlight is how it gives them an outlet for their capital reserves other than U.S. Treasuries, as well as the fact that it gives them an export destination as opposed to having be so dependent on the West for absorbing its exports. Maybe explain that logic a bit more, please. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's exactly what has happened. The Belt and Road Initiative has been a way for China to soak up its excess capital in the way that um, U.S. Treasury bonds used to uh, to do that. Um, I remember the, the historian Neil Ferguson talking about the U.S. and um, Chinese economies being so kind of symbiotic, they, he coined the term Chimerica to talk about them. And one of the things that I think has been happening since the 2008 financial crisis is um, that China has tried to move away from that that model, that, that kind of symbiosis with the U.S. trying to de-link de itself. Um, and that process has been going on a long time. And the Belt and Road Initiative is, in its vast scale and scope, has been a way in which China can invest in, uh, in, in ways that soak up its excess capital, not just in its own borders um, with its huge sort of glut of real estate development that we've seen that is now becoming problematic, but also outside of its borders as well. So an enormous in, uh, program of investment in infrastructure that has, that has um, soaked up capital and uh, expertise and been very useful for Chinese companies uh, in, uh, as well. So it's kind of, uh, you, can, you can see how that has, has fitted together nicely in terms of China's strategy, in terms of politics and economics. Um, Mark, so, I, oh, Simon, I wonder if I could jump in there. Yeah, that would be great, Ian. We'd be happy to hear your insights on this. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a little, just uh, um, to, because because Simon sort of raised the provocation and, and he and I spent hours on Zoom going back and forth um, and I can never let one pass. But look, when Neil Ferguson coined Chimerica, he then started writing about its ending in 2009 with his longtime writing partner, Moritz Shalark. Simon and I have to call out partners in authorship by definition, given that this is a collaboration. And when he did so in 2009, Simon's exactly right. When they did so, it was in the face of the financial crisis. So it had implications about debt, financial assets, and and, and, and the movement of, of money, um, among other things. When uh, John Bateman wrote his major report in 2022 about decoupling, uh, it had less of a focus on, on financial interactions and more on uh, data, an issue that Simon has touched on and more on infrastructure and long-term infrastructure development and infrastructure investment. Um, and what can be done for critical infrastructure in terms of near-term crises if there were conflict, but also the impacts of long-term infrastructure development um, and the way in which uh, decoupling can be managed um, in, in a competitive space, that core space I would argue is infrastructure. Uh, we would argue is probably infrastructure. Um, in a way that is very different from what decoupling looked like in 2009, 2010 in the wake of the financial crisis. I think we can sort of track a strategic change from that moment to this moment in terms of, of the core aspects of competition as it comes to decoupling. Interesting impact. Uh, there's also other economic impacts and that is on standard setting. You argue that this is also, just as there's path dependencies, standards uh, are being shaped by not just the China's active involvement in international organizations that shape standards, but by the corridors and the infrastructure that's uh, being put in place. And this, this standard setting, you know, gives a power and, and revenues of whether it's uh, you, Simon or Ian, whoever wants to jump in on that, uh, talk about how do we, how do we shape standards? Yeah, well, I can, I can come in on this one, Mark. Um, I, you know, one of the one of the uh, big things that China wants to do is overturn a lot of the ways in which the international system, whether that be the economic or political elements of it, have been shaped at moments when it was weaker. Uh, and that becomes very hard to overturn. And that's a form of structural power. Right. And the West has uh, locked in technical architectures and standards that have associated with them very significant revenue streams that accrue with such control of those those standards. And China is now attempting to push its own standards uh, 
the BRI is part of that strategy. Um, and at the same time, it's trying to uh, push to get international institutions to also take up some of its standards in UN regulatory agencies, for example, through diplomacy. So to give you a couple of um, examples, one would be uh, China's work in the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, and that's the United Nations agency that is charged with establishing common standards for telecommunications technologies. China has hugely increased its diplomatic activity at the ITU. It's held lots of leadership roles uh, in international standards organizations, working groups on smart cities, hosted uh, many meetings. It's increased its uh, participation as a donor to many of these agencies. Um, one of the things it's trying to do is gain approval for uh, new forms of internet protocol based on its own technologies and standards. And it wants to do this primarily because legitimacy is confirmed by agencies like the ITU. So it's an important consideration for countries that will then adopt these systems. So that's one example. Another um, perhaps more hypothetical one would be China's um, hugely ambitious idea of a global energy interconnection or GEI. Uh, this, is, this is a sort of incredibly ambitious vision of a globe spanning ultra high voltage transmission system that would link entire continents um, in networks of clean and renewable energy flows, incorporating smart grid technology uh, that we talked about earlier in terms of smart cities and link uh, resources of re renewable energy to the big centers of urban demand. Um, and so, so these are two big examples. That one, I think, shows the scale of the ambition, even though it's more hypothetical, and maybe we'll come back to that. But what we talk about in the book is the idea of new technological zones emerging. So what China's doing, we think, is funding and building global infrastructure construction along these emerging transnational economic corridors. But in order for corridors to work, they require spatial, technological and regulatory coordination in many cases, standardization across a, a huge array of different economies and nation states. And they require the creation of what the um, sociologist of technology, Andrew Barry calls uh, technological zones. So a technological zone is important because it's a form of space that's neither global in extent, nor is it bounded by a particular territory or national borders. But it is a, it's a zone in which the differences between technical practices have been reduced and smoothed out and common standards have been established, whether that's regulations or bureaucratic procedures or computer software or measurements or transportation infrastructure, all these kind of things. They're generating new borders. Um, so being inside a corridor or a technological zone has advantages and costs, as does being outside of one too. Connectivity in this sense becomes a form of relational power and as the BRI generates new connections, it places China more centrally in the global urban system. And developing states may have to then choose between different rival technological zones uh, that are operated by rival competing geopolitical systems. So at many points in the book, and we come back to this, I, I would guess, we talk about the fracturing or splintering of international order and the, the technological zone and the rival standards uh, and, and uh, regulations that could be within that zone are some of the mechanisms by what by which such kind of international splintering uh, could take place. So that's why we think that's an important thing to talk about. Great. I want to go back to the point you've made about energy. China has built three times as much wind, solar and hydropower generating capacity as the United States, and that with the biggest domestic market for solar panels, wind turbines and EVs elites in these technologies, how do you see the so-called green silk road shaping the BRI and how should the West respond to that specifically? Yes, okay, thank you, Leah. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, in one sense, the BRI is about securing markets for the innovations that you talked about and which China has developed significant expertise and that's, that's absolutely clear. Um, but in another deeper sense, I think what it's trying to do, particularly around its, its discussions of or pushing the idea of a green silk road or um, uh, ecological civilization that it talks about, it's trying to be at the leading edge of a new wave of technological innovations that are going to define the future and are going to heavily determine 
uh, the success or failure of great powers in their competition in the future. So the geopolitics of, of net zero, if you like, uh, which will also be an infrastructural geopolitics, I would say as well. And this is where the, the Belt and Road Initiative combines elements of economic competition with competition over the, sh the future shape of international order. So how does this work? China um, is working on several developmental concepts that it hopes are going to form the core of a kind of what I would what they would argue, I think, is a kind of moral leadership for the international system or the foundations of an alternative international society. One of these is this idea of an ecological civilization that I've referenced a few times. It's tried to implement that at home. It hopes it will be attractive abroad and it hopes that the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative will be a mechanism, a set of material conduits by which it can disseminate those kind of ideas abroad. So just as, as it sells its solar panels and its electric vehicles and its smart city solutions, it is also selling a vision of an alternative international society. Um, so to give you a few examples of, of the ways it's doing this, to make that a bit more concrete, at home um, it's trialled a number of what it calls eco-pilot cities, such as uh, in Guiyang in Yunnan province, or Zhongan New City, which is about 100 miles uh, south of Beijing. Those cities and the innovations that they develop can potentially serve of, as models for other developing countries that it can then export abroad. I talked a moment ago about the global energy interconnection, which it sees as uh, this, this global backbone for ultra high voltage transmission that would link different countries in, in continent spanning networks. This is just a dream at the moment, but at the same time, it shows that um, the, the continental or even the globe spanning ambitions behind some of these ideas. Um, and at the same time, and this is something that we talk about quite a lot in the book, is what, how China takes this kind of multi-dimensional approach to its strategy. It has been moving to align this concept of the ecological civilization with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that is something that the UN General Secretary has embraced, actually, as helpful in achieving the SDGs. So, as I say, this is typical of the kind of multidimensional approach that we talk about a lot in the book, seeking to reshape the normative content of existing international institutions while simultaneously developing alternative structures or pathways uh, as well. So the ecological civilization, the green Silk Road, are about trying to develop new forms of international leadership that other states might find compelling, where we might see other states bandwagon with China, become part of its emergent international society based around that leadership. And I think this is what the West needs to realise and to provide its own vision of renewed leadership if it wants to maintain its position. And in some ways, you know, some of the more recent developments uh, show that the Biden administration has to some extent realized this, I think, and has begun to respond with its own initiatives around green technology at home and abroad, with the Inflation Reduction Act, with the uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. So there is a recognition of this, um, but it is, as I said earlier, I think, part of the emerging uh, geopolitics of net zero. Okay, a quick word, if I can, on the, on the multifaceted approach, and, and um, it it doesn't connect directly to the BRI in a traditional sense, but I think it's worth adding because uh, it because it it speaks to Simon's point. He he spoke uh, about uh, ecological civilization in, in the context of technological innovation. There's also been a lot of diplomatic innovation in the in the last decade or fifteen years, and. Uh, uh, among those innovations is the advent and empowerment of city networks. So city networks tend to be anywhere between, say, 100 to 4,000 cities, um, and they facilitate, one, best practice policy exchange between each other, and two, a sort of shared voice on the global stage in places like UN um, agencies and programs. And... <clears throat> These networks, about half of which uh, are transnational or international in nature, allow for the rapid sharing of practices, but also scaling very quickly. And one of the interesting things about Chinese diplomacy is it has recognized that these networks are powerful and has entered into partnerships with them. Some of them, uh, 
represent upwards of 25% of global GDP, 12% of the global population. And with that network, for example, China's entered into an agreement to work on construction practices around building and energy efficiency. Now, that's just like nitty gritty diplomacy one and nitty gritty urban building two. But together, it offers an op opportunity to sort of be a global leader at the subnational level on climate um, and also to have influence on urban practices and design abroad. Uh, so the multifaceted approach that Simon spoke to can be seen in everything from the SDGs to like subnational diplomacy that most diplomats aren't paying attention to, but offers great scale and impact very quickly. As you read through your book, the to-do list for the U.S. government and others, you know, just piles up of the things that we really ought to be doing more. And also to, you get the sense that we need to have U.S. and Europe and our other friends working in more close coordination as opposed to uh, so much uh, competing with each other uh, on these big issues that we just uh, talked about. But let me stick with you, Ian, because you mentioned cities, but I'm fascinated by corridors. And uh, I was really uh, struck by the emphasis you have on, on corridors throughout the book and the fact that you suggest that the history of, of how you ha have global order, of how you project sustained power, uh, goes through cities and the corridors that connect them and the infrastructure that is embedded within that. We have just begun to think about corridors in the West. Uh, recently, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure has focused on the Libido Corridor in Africa. And at the last G20 meeting, they outlined the India to Middle East to Europe uh, corridor. But, but describe how important corridors are and why it's important that we, we think about them more in terms of our, our not just our diplomacy, but also how we invest uh, and support infrastructure around the world. Thanks, Mark, and um, I'm glad uh, you mentioned that. I mean, the announcement at the G20, uh, I think, was was lost to the news a little bit, and in fact, has become a little bit of a um, of a talking point against some traditional problems that we're seeing elsewhere in the world. What, uh, the question being whether we can really rethink um, spatial connectivity and its impact on order and then integrating it into to a foreign policy approach. It's funny, you know, I sit, um, I don't know, eight miles, 10 miles from the Google headquarters, 15 from Apple, uh, 12 from Facebook right now. And, and the sun is reflecting uh, on my face as it comes up in California. And, and, you know, if we talked about power and space 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we would have looked at Richard Florida's the creative class or the smartest places on earth. And, wondered about these sort of ecosystems that develop that have um, both elite public and private uh, educational institutions, good health care, vibrant city centers, and the way they all came together to, to fuel innovation. Of course, you guys are sitting in Washington and know very well that um, uh, government investment often sits at the core of those spaces too. We're not talking so much anymore about these special ecosystems, but rather connectivity. And, and I think the movement from say a, a Silicon Valley as a source of power approach to a corridor approach is, is an interesting and important one that we could sort of look at it in a meta sense over the last uh, 15 to, to 10 years. Um, and it was buried in uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan's speech at Brookings in April, the idea uh, of changing our uh, approach in terms of foreign policy to development and um, economic growth, um, which I think is, is important and, and telling. You know, the India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor is particularly ambitious. And, and Simon uh, points out well, it will require creating a sort of um, technology zone that will in and of itself be a diplomatic challenge, but it aims to move across a range of infrastructure types, um, which is really exciting. According to the announcements, um, it will move commercial goods, data, energy, um, and it's not singular. It's an area focused for the corridor. It means its development will include at a minimum also rail, ports, undersea cables, other digital components, and energy infrastructure. And, and I think these are all familiar components of the BRI uh, infrastructure menu. Um, and so it does speak to a, to a catching up and a realization. Um, but they're also important corridors, I think, uh, to get back to the intellectual and strategic point um, in that they 
demonstrate a shift in how we're thinking about space. Distant though they seem, um, they in fact give the, the Biden administration's efforts to link foreign policy and domestic economic well-being, um, grit and texture. In that April speech, uh, I think Sullivan outlined a number of approaches to delivering on the so-called foreign policy for the middle class. And these included revitalizing domestic manufacturing and safeguarding emerging technologies and critical infrastructure. But they also required the idea of um, moving beyond traditional trade deals and thinking about new international economic partnerships. And I think that would be a prime example of a, of a corridor, a spatial one, um, that is new and innovative. And, and Simon can actually speak to this quite well, but one of the direct implications of a corridor, as opposed to say a cluster-based approach, which you would see out here in California, um, is that corridors have implications for cities that work alongside and within them. They favor some cities that have certain economic features or uh, infrastructure features or transportation features. And they, um, they probably work to the disfavor of others. And so they'll lead to a sort of new urban hierarchy, the same way that the global city, the American hegemony of, of particularly the post-Cold War favored cities that, that could attract talent one and that facilitated financial exchange and the global services that enabled that. Very good. Ian, I want to return our conversation to ports. Your book discusses the many roles that ports play in China's BRI strategy, helping to secure sea land and channels of trade as gateways and inland corridors and as military bases. You mentioned that Chinese documents have noted ambitions for maritime bases in the very same strategic locations where China has invested in the maritime elements of the BRI, including Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Pakistan and the Seychelles. Help us better understand how China views ports. Thanks, and of course, since we referenced the books, that's, that's Doshi's book. And, and I'll also say that I know you've written about this, Leah, so we should please jump in uh, uh, with Mark Simon and me with, with your perspective. I think you've written about it a little bit from, from the perspective of certain German cities and even speaks to the way some of this data uh, and these deals can get decoupled very quickly uh, in certain instances when there's a geopolitical change. So um, jump in. You know, I buy Isaac Cardin's argument that one of the, uh, uh, and, and we reflected it in our book, that ports that seem to be uh, traditional uh, shipping lane ports, uh, we understand the importance of the Chinese economy, Simon outlined that can also um, have dual uses. Uh, we need only track uh, who's moving through these ports to understand that. Um, and so I, I think that's a pretty understood and, and clear argument. I mean, I think that where the, the conversation gets a, a little trickier um, is one, how some of the long-term deals around ports um, will work out, uh, uh, if they'll work out. And two, as I referenced earlier, the sort of ecosystem that's being built around them. Simon and I, um, are quite struck by, although the dual use of ports is, is pretty easy to understand, the degree to which the development of them actually has all these ad hoc features. I mean, we know the players, Costco and others. Um, but if you look at, say, Djibouti City and the new port there versus Guadalajara City, um, it's not very easy to detail uh, an approach to developing the ecosystem that has to work around the port and its implications for the politics of the city and, uh, say, province or country in which they exist. Um, so from a diplomatic angle, the ports are quite remarkable because in certain instances, you'll have century long um, agreements. In other instances, there's a, something much closer to an ad hoc attempt uh, to just develop the, the early stages of something that might take 20 or 30 or 40 years to develop. Um, and that depends on where you are in the world and what the politics of them are. Uh, and in that, I think you get to a point which is, again, you can make the basic point about dual use, but also the, the sort of nimble in some instances and failing in others approach that differs port by port to port is to me telling of, of how the BRI is being deployed, some of its weaknesses, but also the implications for urban spaces where it's developing around the world. And when we think about- What do you think? What, let's, let's uh, <laughs> yeah. go ahead. I'm sure LA would have some good insights on that. <laughs> I have to say, I also do buy, buy Isaac Cardin's argument about dual use applications of ports, but I think something that's really fascinating is that we only have one model where we see a port, well, one actual model that has been confirmed, 
is Djibouti, right? So I think there's a lot of we don't know yet, but something that has emerged is that China's approach there is very multifaceted. And I think we will see play out in the next three to 10 years and what that's going to look like. So I'm looking a lot into that. Well, when we look at the Red Sea, when we look at the, uh, the Panama Canal, uh, not being able to have uh, go uh, traffic go through in the same way, and the ports and the fact that U.S. is ownership is really uh, outside of U.S. Not, a, not existing. And when we add the fact that there's really no U.S. shippers, you can add a whole bunch of other reasons why these corridors are important. So, uh, again, the more I read your book, the more concern I get and uh, the more to-do lists that pile up that we really need to focus on, on key priorities. Uh, and when we add those all up, we've talked about corridors, uh, economic uh, uh, free trade areas. Uh, we've talked about clusters. We've talked about the, the technology zones. Uh, but if that builds up to, as you suggest as a possibility in your book, to a Eurasian common market, uh, you, you say that the Eurasian trade is already twice the transatlantic trade. But if that combined into a Eurasian uh, mar common market, that would have profound consequences for the, the U.S. and the West. So, Ian, maybe explain a little bit more what's the prospects of that and what consequences would there be uh, for the West? Thanks, Mark. And just, you know, I'm actually going to punt that one to Simon because he loves the common markets. I, I mean, I know that I, I had planned, but I also just wanted to, to echo what you just said. I think that the framework you just laid out in terms of the risk of the global trade bringing in the the Panama Canal and, and the Red Sea and then um, our limited ownership abroad is, is right on. Uh, and so th thanks for adding that. It's, I think it, it adds a totally necessary geopolitical frame. Yeah, I mean, to come in on that, I, I would say, you know, ultimately, if this were all to be successful and join up in the way that China would like it to, then, you know, over the decades, as we, we talked about, this is a big project. You know, the short answer is that it would shift global trade in the direction of China. Uh, it would increase uh, China's international weight and its leadership credentials. And the center of uh, economic gravity would shift further eastward and drag, you know, Africa and Europe and Asia along with it. And, um, you know, the consequences for the U.S. and, and the West uh, would be quite profound. Uh, another thing we need to work on not having occur. Uh, go ahead. So the Belt and Road Initiative and its role in international order through urbanism was one of Xi's first initiatives back in 2013. More recently, we have seen the emergence of the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative. How do these later initiatives either reinforce the BRI or steer Chinese foreign policy in a very different direction? Um. Yeah, thank you for that one. So, so this this in many respects is one of the problems with writing a book in the fact that you write it and then it takes a very long time for the book to reach the market and reach the audience. And so you're kind of constantly hoping that things don't happen that are going to, you know, uh, upset your argument. Um, but I think, you know, these these uh, more recent, um, you know, initiatives. So the Global Security Initiative, you mentioned the Global Development Initiative, the Global Civilization Initiative, which have all come out in the last sort of 18 months. Um, I, I, my personal opinion is that they actually reinforce the grand strategy that began with the Belt and Road Initiative, if we think of it as a long term, you know, multi decade, multi uh, generational project to uh, shift the nature of international order, a, a kind of long term vision. I would say they are an evolution uh, in that strategy and possibly demonstrate greater confidence in international leadership on the part of Beijing as that leadership has begun to evolve over the last decade. So I don't think they undermine the idea that the Belt and Road is is, is still important. Um, you know, there are a few developments. Well, one thing we could say about them is that they are not particularly well uh, sketched out at the moment. So we don't know a lot of detail. I mean, in March uh, of last year, Xi Jinping brokered this agreement between Iran, Iran and Saudi Arabia to restore their diplomatic relations. That was under the umbrella of the Global Security Initiative, but we're still waiting really to see what the content is, is going to be. They're not clearly defined. They're obviously related to each other. I would expect them to evolve into a kind of alternate vision for international order over the next 10 years. 
Um, we could say about the Global Civilization Initiative that it feels like it defends a kind of state focused, uh, um, you know, state centric value system. It, it also pushes back on the idea of universal values, it seems. So by that, you know, human rights and liberal democracy, uh, fairly consistent with established positions that China's had. Um, taken together, they continue to demonstrate this this is dissatisfaction that China has with the normative content of international order, which represents for them the dominance of the US and the West uh, that was put in place, as I said earlier, at a time of, of relative Chinese weakness. And as China rises, it's, it's going to hope to shape that international order in line with its own values. Um, and that would, you know, would see itself as gaining power at the expense of the US. So we would expect new ideas about international security or international development or the nature of uh, what it means uh, to talk about civilization to emerge in the context of a rising power uh, and to begin to influence other states. And this is something we've seen repeatedly in history, right? It's, it's a truism. Great powers try to shape international order to reflect their own values and preferences. And I think these concepts are just an extension of, of, of what we've seen with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, beginning it. And you know, as they try to shape uh, the world, uh, Ian, we'll go back to you on this fracturing. We've already sort of mentioned it a bit earlier, uh, but the idea that there's rival technologies, rival infrastructures competing with each other, and that we may have that evolve into a, a fracturing. We, we've always l thought of the world in recent years as sort of one global market. And whenever I travel to Asia in particular, I, I always hear, uh, we don't want to choose uh, between the U.S. and uh, rival powers. But I say in, in one aspect you have to choose, is Huawei in the back room uh, for your telecommunications or not, uh, to give a point on this. See, tell me how you see the possibilities of fracturing evolving, how pronounced it would be, could become, and, and what consequences that would have for our economy and foreign policy. Thanks, Mark. And I think the Huawei example goes directly to something that, that Leia has written, too, about uh, German cities and, and their proximity to or then subsequent distancing from um, from that embeddedness uh, and collaboration. And, you know, you've done uh, uh, something throughout this conversation that I appreciate, which is trying to keep us focused on a sort of to do list. Um, you know, and what, what it means for, for policymakers in place at, at, say, the State Department or um, the National Security Council, uh, DOD, and elsewhere, um, and our friends in Europe, of course, um, and elsewhere. Uh, and and I, I think that to-do list is both sort of conceptual, it involves strategic frames, uh, and then there are actually practical um, things, too. Uh, I mentioned that because I think that the the fracturing of the world, so to speak, the, the U.S., the end of U.S. hegemony and sort of our um, settling into a, a role as the preeminent power, um, but not the unipolar one, um, it is happening as, as two things are happening at the same moment. We're seeing these grand strategic plans, such as the BRI. Um, we're seeing the implementation of them through uh, infrastructure, uh, most importantly. But then simultaneously, we have um, certain crises in the world that look more like traditional ones. Uh, and so there's, of course, the war in Gaza. There's the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, which looks a lot like traditional great power politics and um, in its most bellicose form. Uh, and, and when you look at some of those conflicts, it raises the question, uh, and of course, some of the alternative arrangements that are coming up around them, say Russia-North Korea collaboration, um, the return of conversations about the so-called axis of evil and taking that very seriously. Uh, is why would we be thinking about corridors, for example, or why are we talking about um, data infrastructure? Uh, and one response is that if you look at our um, our most important competitor, those are the terms by which they are playing a long-term strategic game, and we need to analyze that and take it seriously too. Um, if the PRC is going to think seriously about infrastructure, if they're going to invest in ports, if they're going to embed uh, their data infrastructure in cities around Africa, we should at least ask ourselves, whether or not we should be engaged in alternative options, but for our partner states out there in the world, for those urban spaces um, and for the connectivity that it requires. And I think when you look at the developments of the past five years that have been discussed, or maybe even eight uh, that go along with some of the, the COVID um, supply chain developments, I'd say uh, chips and, and other issues, um, we're starting to, to recognize that the 
the necessity of, of managing both if it can be done, playing those long-term strategic gains that involve um, infrastructure, new geospatial thinking such as corridors, um, focused engagement in places like ports while simultaneously having to engage in some, um, some diplomatic issues that seem very traditional, um, but obviously are also pressing. Um, so the, the two things are happening overlapping in a way. I would like to discuss the current state and the future of the BRI a little bit more. Recent reports are saying that the BRI's momentum in its 10th decade is slowing, with some saying the BRI of 10 years ago may not even exist anymore today. How will the slowdown in Chinese lending and infrastructure abroad make less potent many of these trends you portend in your book? Um, I'll take that one. So, I mean, certainly China has been scaling back investments in the in the BRI. Certainly it's been learning some of the lessons from the last 10 years. It's had some bad investments. There's no doubt about that. There's been a lot of failures. There's been a lot of negativity and negative publicity as well. Um, there's been mistakes, I, I definitely think. Um, and also this reflects where we are today in terms of the context. The context is very different. Um, we've got we've had the shock of COVID. Uh, the pandemic, we've had the slowdown in the Chinese economy, um, the widening fiscal deficit that they have, the problems in the real estate sector that we talked about earlier. Um, so the, the economic and political context uh, today, compared to when the Belt and Road Initiative was launched 10 years ago, is, uh, is very different. But I would still say, you know, in terms of what I said earlier, I don't think the overall direction of travel has changed. We just had the third Belt and Road Forum at the end of 2023. The Belt and Road Initiative is built into the Chinese constitution. Uh, President Xi himself has uh, staked a lot of personal capital in this, right? So it's part of the so-called Xi, Xi Jinping thought. And um, the, you know, the other thing we could say about the Belt and Road Initiative is it's never been, probably deliberately, a very well-defined uh, term or project. It's an umbrella term that's deliberately uh, more akin to a brand than a clearly defined project. So it's hard to, to say whether it's gonna fail or not because you can't judge it in that sense. So I think what you have to ask really is, will China abandon its ambitions to transform the nature of international order in the way that we talked about earlier to fit its own growing power and preferences? And I think you have to say the answer to that is almost certainly no, right? So. You know, the various uh, ambitious, ambitious new initiatives that we talked about earlier, the, the, the security, development, civilizational initiatives also tell us that, that the, these um, ambitions are not going away and that the Belt and Road Initiative is part of that, um, even if it evolves. But I'd say one um, other final thing about it as well that brings us back to the central message of the book is that if we talk about is the Belt and Road Initiative going to go away? As we've said, the Belt and Road Initiative, we can think of as the material components of these, these ambitions to change the nature of international order. It is a recognition that in order for these ambitions of, to, take, to take root in the world and endure, they must be given material form via infrastructure, via cities and institutions. And that is the, one of the key arguments about in the nature of international order and the way that it can be transformed and endure that we make in the book. Um, so this is, you know, this is just to finish on this. This is what um, President Xi has called the China dream, uh, the dream of a new leading role for China in international society, one that has soft power as well as hard power, as well as material durability. But as we say in the book, uh, not all dreams become reality. It's, it's by no means certain that the China dream will come to pass and there will be a lot of potential resistance to it. There's no doubt about that. Well, uh, Simon Kernis, uh, Ian Klaus, uh, thank you for writing this important book, uh, The BRI City. It really uh, widens the aperture in terms of how we view BRI, how we view uh, the strategic competition that is currently going on between uh, China and its allies in the West. So an important book. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for spending time with us helping to uncover many of the insights you bring forth in the book. I want to thank uh, Leah Tome uh, from the, uh, our Schwartzman Fellow here at the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm Mark Kennedy, a director of the WABA Institute for Strategic Competition. We appreciate you being with us here today. Stay tuned for more coverage of 
infrastructure and other important issues affecting strategic competition.